allow me to set the scene for my talk uh, with some statistics. Every day, 1.6 billion cups of coffee are consumed in the world. The producer countries, that's Brazil with 37 million bags every year, Vietnam with 24 million bags every year, right down to my own country, Uganda, with 3 million bags, earn $24 billion a year from their coffee. The value addition countries, the coffee shops, and all those roasters who process earn close to $100 billion a year. The coffee market, 50% of that market, is controlled by five companies. And 25 million small-scale farmers produce 80% of the coffee that you and I drink every day. Now hear this. In 2011, Africa produced 12% of the total exports of coffee in the world. A country in Europe produced more coffee than the whole of Africa. Germany re-exported 11.9 million bags of coffee, worth 3.6 billion. Africa had produced 10 million bags, worth 2 billion. The last time I checked, I never saw a single coffee tree in Germany. It happens with cocoa. 70% of the world's cocoa production is from four countries. Cameroon, Nigeria, Ivory Coast, and Ghana. But they only produce 1% of value-added chocolates in the world. African producers fetch only 7 to 10 percent of the retail value of the crops that they produce. There's something wrong with that picture. It's unjust, it's unfair, and it must change. Ten years ago, I began my journey. I set up a company called Good African Coffee with a vision to bring quality coffees to the global market by working with small-scale farmers in western Uganda. The journey began in the slopes of the Renzori Mountains, uh, where we went to meet farmers, to try and partner with them in an effort to bring these quality coffees to the market. And when we got there, one of the interesting things was we didn't find the kind of romanticized image that we read in a lot of NGO uh, publications, you know, these needy, poor, small-scale farmers waiting for this outsider to come and save them. We found astute. We found farmers who knew what they wanted. Yes, they were in poverty, but they were poor because they lacked opportunities. Opportunities to improve their income and transform their households. We found that they had a lot of social capital. They had land, they had their labor, and they had some knowledge in how they grow their coffee. And so as a company, we sought to partner with them in those areas where they already had assets. So we began with knowledge transfer. How do you harvest your coffee better, that you can fetch a better price? How do you practice agronomy in a way that will bring the best crop to the market, from pruning to uh, planting new coffee trees to mulching to how to harvest the red cherries and, and to really bring a quality product at the end of the process, right up to post-harvest methods. We also then transferred some technical skills and also technical inputs. Hand palpers. How do you wash your coffee to be able to get a better product at the end? And we engaged in institutional capacity building, putting the farmers into produce organizations of 50 farmers per group. They elect their leadership. We then train the trainers, who then train the rest of the farmers in the group. We also found that the farmers had a big problem with the rural loan sharks. So they really had very little in terms of access to credit. So we put some people to help train them in terms of access to credit and also pulling their resources together and in terms of financial literacy training. Boy, it was tough to convince these farmers to come on board. 
I remember some of the earlier meetings we had would, would make these big announcements in Kasese and say, farmers come to this meeting, uh, we're here to buy the coffee and all this lovely marketing stuff that you do. And, you know, would receive like 50 grandmothers and their grandkids, you know. And I was like, this is not a good way to start a business. <laughs> and, and this would go on for, for months until we identified a, a head teacher in Ihandiro sub-county up in the mountain uh, called Masereka. And we went and sold our vision to him. Big lesson about rural legitimacy. Huh? Uh, you might have the best ideas, but for you to be able to have an impact and to be listened to and to be taken seriously, you really need real partnerships where people really buy into the vision. So when we spoke to Masereka, he said, look, I'll call the meeting. And voila, you know, he called the meeting and 200 farmers showed up, healthy-bodied young men and women, uh, ready to listen to what we had to share, and there began a process, farmer by farmer, group by group, village by village, uh, sub-county by sub-county. We built 280 producer organizations, 14,000 farmers, and we have 17 savings and credit corps. While that exciting stuff was happening in, in, in the rural economy, on the enterprise side, we were facing our own challenges. So our idea was to bring the quality coffees roasted and packed at source to the global market. Everybody talks about export-led growth, right? That's the way Africa is going to develop, export-led growth. But it took me two and a half years to get a single product on the supermarket shelf in the UK. Two and a half years. You know why? Convincing the supermarket buyer that an African business, an SME, could bring a quality product to the global market was the biggest impediment. It wasn't because they doubted the coffee. The coffee comes from Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, produces great coffee. But in the mind of the buyer was this barrier that an African business person, an SME leader, can bring this coffee to the market because they haven't been doing that. They'd never dealt with many SME businesses bringing products to the market. We rarely add value to our products, and we rarely bring finished products to the market. I think Africa exports 18% only of manufactured value-added products. So that mindset issue was a big challenge. Another challenge was access to capital. I must have visited 36 banks, you know, probably more, and took my business plan to one bank to another, no one was interested. Adding value to an agriculture product? Excuse me? Has anyone done it before? Nobody has done it before, but I'm kind of thinking of myself as a pioneer. No, it's not going to work. And uh, the tenth bank would even call the eleventh bank and say, by the way, that Rugasira chap has been here, and uh, he might be coming your way. <laughs> and, you know, these are lessons... Now, I have several privileges. I am bicultural, I've traveled a little bit, I speak the language, so I can go to a supermarket, buy in Tesco, and know how to behave myself. But just imagine all these other businesses that don't have those advantages, that might not even be able to speak the business language that is required. What is their chance? What's their opportunity? If accessing capital is so difficult for a company like ours, that seemingly has some advantages, how about the other? SME companies. The bankers don't lend to agriculture. In Uganda today, only 3.8% of loans goes to the agriculture sector. 3.8%. But 70% of the population earn a living from agriculture. And supposedly, the private sector is the engine for growth. There's something wrong with that picture. Not only was it difficult to get the product on the shelf, it was difficult to access capital, it was difficult to get technologies and to know about all the branding that's required to be competitive. And let's talk about competitiveness. If I'm borrowing a 28% per annum as a coffee brand owner company, how am I going to compete in Waitrose with someone who borrows 3% or 4%? It's a big issue. It's a big problem. And we need to focus the conversation on those issues. We have witnessed some degree of impact. We have bought 1,500 tons of coffee, and the farmers, thank goodness, 
of being able to link quality with price. That was the biggest issue. We never wanted to, tell, to communicate to them that we're paying you a premium price because we feel sorry for you. These are savvy business people. It was to make the link between a quality product and a quality price. If you do these things that ensure your quality of your coffee is great, you will get a better price. It's not because we feel sorry, but because that's what you deserve. So that was a success. We managed to put the product on the shelves in the UK and made some forays into the online uh, uh, in the US and are also retailing our coffees in the region, in Uganda and Kenya and Tanzania. But the farmers also came together and began to work in their producer organizations. They began to pull their savings into their savings and credit corps. So there was an impact, the beginnings of an impact in the communities. Their household incomes went up. Farmers who were delivering, I don't know if you have seen images of farmers in the mountainous areas delivering coffee on their head, bare feet. Okay? They tie the, the, the sack of coffee on their back and the rope goes on their head and they deliver it down the mountain, indignified for a commodity that you and I spend $2 per cup on average. But today, these farmers bulk their coffee, they hire trucks, they move from you know, walking on foot to bicycles to motorbikes, what we call border borders in Uganda. And they're delivering these coffees and getting a good price and transforming their lives. We're only a catalyst. We're not this romanticized savior that comes riding in to solve their problems. No one can ever be. The key to their transformation is them. We can help unlock. We can help empower. We can help give knowledge. We can help share knowledge. We can help create an incentive regime that points them into the direction where they can get better prices for their crop, but it is ultimately them who have the key for their transformation. As I close, I'd like to leave you with some thoughts. Western economic theory puts at its central foundation the importance of the private sector. The private sector is the engine for growth. The private sector are the innovators, the creators of jobs, the taxpayers, the ones who create prosperity. But in the conversation on Africa, the private sector is just part of rhetoric. Part of rhetoric. How much money is spent on agriculture in Uganda every year? 4% of the budget. I've told you already, 3.8% of loans go to agriculture. Why isn't this reality translated into the policy documents, into the conversation, and into the capital flows? Up to today, my own company can't access capital to scale up. Can't. We've put a product on the shelf. In 2005, we we're the first African-owned brand to put the product on the shelf. At that time, it sounded great. But when you think about it, it's, it's, it's embarrassing. I mean, Robusta Coffee is indigenous to Uganda. I mean. Africa is the origin of Arabica coffee? I mean, shame on us. I mean, we should have branded coffees all over the place. Switzerland imports 2.4% of the global production of coffee, yet exports the highest value of coffee, 8 billion. I mean, there's something wrong with that picture. So what I'd like you to go away with is how can we privilege in a real and meaningful sense the conversation around the private sector involvement in transformation. How do we get capital flows? Instead of just dealing with the public sector as a solution to market failures and constraints to growth, why don't we make it available to the private sector? Every single stimulus program that has been witnessed, drawn, uh, implemented over the last three, four years has focused on who? on the private sector, because in a real sense, they're the engine for growth. Why aren't we the real engine for growth in Africa? I hope you can take this conversation in your discussions, in your policy discussions, in your programs, in your capital flows, to change the accent on who is the real 
engine and key for transformation. We have seen farmers like Kaitson Charles, Xavier Buanandeke, who when we met them had mud and water houses. Today they have corrugated iron sheets. They have dignity because they haven't been given something because someone feels sorry for them. They have dignity because through their innovation, through their hard work, through their focus, they've been able to transform their lives, bring dignity to their families and to their communities. And guess what? They want the same things you and I want. They want good health care. They want good education. In Bwanandeke's village called Kataukenene, when we went there in 2004, there was no single university graduate. Today, there are five. And one of his daughters was translating with some friends who had gone to visit uh, Wanandeke. And so one of uh, my friends, uh, a guest, uh, asked, so what would you like to be? Would you like to be a farmer like your father? Because the assumption is, uh, like child, uh, like father. And she goes, absolutely not. I don't want to be a farmer. I want to be an engineer. Something happens when people's household income grows, their aspiration grows, when they're involved and engaged in a little more complex business activities, their whole mindset and worldview shifts. Will you also shift your mindset? Will you put the resources, the thinking, the documentation, where the real key to transformation in Africa is? And that's with the farmer and the private sector. Thank you.